Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. We're going to start a study through the book of 1 John this morning. If you'd like to get your Bibles and turn to the little epistle way back towards the end of the New Testament, 1 John will be in chapter 1 and a good portion of chapter 2 this morning. And uh, we're working our way pretty close to the end of the New Testament. So uh, it'll probably take us a little while to get through uh, the book of Revelation, but, but that's okay. We've got a little ways to go before we get there. I'll begin reading at verse number one. I'll look at the first four verses of 1 John chapter one, and then we'll compare some verses that John the Apostle wrote in his Gospel of John. Remember that John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John has five chapters in it. 2nd John and 3rd John each just have one chapter each. And then John the Apostle also wrote the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it's amazing the uh, things that we find in all three of his different writings, his gospel, his epistles, and the book of Revelation. It's amazing the things that we find in them uh, that are similar or some common things that he had to say or thoughts that he was thinking about. So in 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Of course, he's talking about the Lord Jesus here. And back in verse number one, when it says the word of life, word there was capitalized in my New King James translation, which means that the translators understood that to be a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy or our joy may be full. So, as I said, John the Apostle wrote these epistles as well as he also wrote the Gospel of John. And so I want to go back and read the first five verses of chapter one of the Gospel of John and see how they relate to these first four verses that we've just read in the epistle of 1 John chapter one. So in John's Gospel, chapter one, the first five verses, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So remember that uh, word that John used in the first chapter of the Gospel of John and that he used in the first chapter of the epistle of First John was a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that the word, based on that, I guess you could call it as close to a genealogy as you could get to deity, which deity has no genealogy. But when it says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, there, speaking of Jesus, was from eternity past. His beginning was just not when he was born in Bethlehem as a child, but his beginning, if there is such a thing, was from eternity past, and he was involved with the creation. John was an eyewitness, he tells us here in 1 John chapter 1. He was an eyewitness because he was one of those 12 apostles who was with Jesus all during the time of his ministry. And so he wants us to know he was an eyewitness 
the things that we've seen and heard, we declare to you, he said. Our eyes have beheld him. Our hands have touched him. He wants to declare to us this eyewitness account for over three years that he encountered so that we might have fellowship with him and with the Lord. And one of the reasons that we find here at the end of uh, verse four in this passage, one of the reasons that John wrote this little epistle was so that our joy would be full. We'll see some other purposes and reasons for him writing the letter also as we go through uh, 1 John. So now we'll drop down to verses 5 through 10. Here we have a subheading that says fellowship with him and with one another. Verse 5 and following. This is the message that we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So here, John is saying that all of us have sinned. And we certainly can understand that and agree with that because uh, all of us have a human uh, nature that has inherited a sin nature from our earthly father, Adam. And so we all are sinners because we have a sin nature. There are sometimes people who believe that once they become a believer, that they don't sin anymore. And we'll see that there will be a verse or two in this epistle that caused people to think that or to have that notion. But I believe that's because they interpret what John is saying incorrectly, and we'll deal with that when we come to it. Because as long as we're in our human flesh, we will continue to fail and to sin. And so he will speak with that uh, in these verses, as he did here. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then he went on to say in verse 9, if we're faithful to confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we'll deal more with that as we move throughout this epistle. So he said here that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, that's almost exactly what Jesus said of himself. One of those seven I am statements that John the apostle recorded in his gospel of John was when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he is also the second person of the Trinity. Another way of wording verse 7 was, if we walk in Christ as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And if we are in Christ, the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. When we sin, our sin breaks or interrupts our fellowship with him. But when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's as if our fellowship with him is renewed and refreshed. Now we'll look into chapter two and we'll look at the first two verses of chapter two. The subheading here says the test of knowing Christ. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, and their advocate in my New King James translation is capitalized, meaning that it's a re direct reference to Jesus himself. So we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous.
and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. These two verses are full of important information. Another purpose we find here in the first verse of chapter 2 of John writing this epistle is so that we might not sin. He's giving us this information so that we might choose to follow Christ and be obedient to him in his words and his commandments and that we might not sin. But he knows that we're going to sin. And so he could just as well have said, and when we do sin, we have as believers an advocate, which is Jesus Christ, our Savior himself, who is now at the right hand of God the Father. And he will make intercession for us. So he himself, it says here in verse 2, is the propitiation of our sins. Remember that is a word that's a, I sometimes call it a $3 word or a, a $64,000 word for that matter. Uh, that means a complete satisfactory substitutionary substitute for our sins or for us as a payment for our sins. And in fact, one of the men that I have set under his teaching at various times has used this particular verse as a test for the translation that a person has of the Bible to determine if it's a good translation or not. I understand completely what he says, and I'll share that with you, but uh, I would not encourage you to do away with your translation if it says atonement there instead of propitiation. And so when it says in verse two, he himself is the propitiation of our sins. In some of the translations that people have, it will say he is the atonement for our sin. And technically, as we've said many times before, and so I always want to drive that home, that atonement means a covering. And that's what the animal sacrifices were in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law. And in fact, remember that when the person would bring those animals for a sacrifice as a substitute for themselves, they would place their hand on the head of that sacrificial animal as if they were ceremonially transferring their sin to that innocent sacrificial animal as the one that would also then be the substitute for them. And it would die in their place. And the shed blood of that animal would be a covering and atonement for their sin. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So it's just a covering. It's like a down payment until the Lord Jesus himself comes once and for all as that final sacrifice for sin. And as the writer of Hebrews says, once at the end of the ages, he presented himself once and for all, a substitutionary propitiation, sacrifice that was satisfactory with God the Father for our sin. And since it is a propitiation, it is a total cleansing and a taking away of our sin so that it's not needed to be repeated year after year as those animal sacrifices were under the old Mosaic covenant. So he himself is the propitiation of our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And so there's an answer to some people that say or believe that God does not intend for all people to be saved, but he intends for some people to be saved. My opinion is that the Bible teaches that it's God's desire that everyone would come to a saving knowledge and trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he knows the end from the beginning and he knows that all people will not do that. And so the ones that he knows, since he knows the end from the beginning, he knows who of us will trust and believe in Christ and he refers to those as the elect. But I'm just about to get into some deep water here that deals with the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism, and I don't want to go there at this point. It's not the focus of this particular study. But just understand that Jesus was the complete satisfactory substitutionary substitute 
for our sins. He took our place. It should have been us that died on the cross and to pay for eternity for our sins. But Jesus paid for them in a moment in time when he gave up his life on the cross and his blood would shed for us. And he could do that because he was completely innocent, just like that sacrificial lamb of God, without spot, without blemish. And he was able to pay for our sins because he had no sin. And God showed us that he was satisfied with that because he raised him from the dead. Just like when the people in the old covenant days would know that God had accepted the blood that had been sprinkled by the high priest before the mercy seat and the Holy of Holies, when the high priest came back alive out of the Holy of Holies, out of the tabernacle or the temple to pray and to bless the people, they would then know that he came out of life. He came out from being in God's presence alive, meaning that God was satisfied for that particular time. And so since Jesus was raised from the dead once and for all, then that means that God is forever satisfied that Jesus has eternally paid for our sins. We move now to verse 3 through 11 in chapter 2. And here is another subheading, the test of knowing him. Now by this, we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Remember how John the Apostle in the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John used that word abide, meaning to be in Christ, a dozen times or more in that one chapter. He uses it again here. He says, he who abides in him, in Christ, ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. Verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. Remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So he who loves his brother or other believers abides in Christ. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Where it says here, if we keep his commandments, is very similar to what John the Apostle recorded Jesus as having said in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And I'll read some of those verses. In verse 21 of John's 14th chapter of the Gospel, He who is my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And then in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So one of these tests of knowing and loving Jesus, thereby having assurance of salvation is having love for other Christians. Another similarity to what Jesus said in John's gospel, chapter 15 and verse two, Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And earlier in that upper room discourse, he told the 12 apostles, the world will know that you are mine because of the way you love one another.
So now we come to verses 12, 13, and 14 of 1 John chapter 2, and it speaks about their spiritual state or standing before God. And then we're going to see three levels of maturing in Christ here. I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children because you have known the father. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So three distinct levels of maturity, little children, young men, and fathers. Part of growing and maturing in Christ is knowing our status and our, our condition in Christ and with Christ. These verses, by default, remind us again that there are two groups of people in the world, saved people and lost people. You can reduce all of mankind who have ever lived or who will ever live into those two categories, saved or lost, believers or unbelievers, obedient to Christ or disobedient. And so the last portion that we'll look at this morning is verses 15, 16, and 17 of 1 John chapter 2. And then we'll look at the remaining portion of chapter 2 at the beginning of our time next week. The subheading here says, do not love the world. So in verse 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of the Father abides forever. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life were all involved in Eve's being deceived in the garden. And back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it said, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the eyes... And that it was pleasant, oh, I'm sorry, that would be the lust of the flesh, good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes, that would be the lust of the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise, that would be associated with the pride of life. She took of it and ate its fruit. So there was the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I believe that every sin that I've ever committed or ever will commit can all be taken back to one of those three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And I believe that every sin that every person has ever committed can be taken back to its very foundation in one of those three temptations. Well, that's a pretty uh, interesting look at the first chapter and a good portion of chapter two We've seen a couple of purposes that John wrote this epistle of 1 John. We'll see some more as we go through the remaining portions of it. But so far, he told us that he wrote this, that our joy might be full. And then he said, he wrote this to us that we might not sin. But then he said, when you do sin, remember that we have an advocate with the Father. It's like a defense attorney, the greatest one who ever lived the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who when we sin, and then Satan, the accuser, speaks reproachfully to God because of my sin. Jesus is there as my advocate and says, Greg is under the blood. And then God would look upon me and see me through the righteousness of Christ not because of anything I've done, because I have no righteousness. 
The Bible says that all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. But when he looks upon us who have trusted in Christ, he sees that we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. As King David said in the Psalms, our sin has been imputed to him and his righteousness has been imputed to us. Well, next week, if you want to read ahead, uh, read the remaining portion of chapter two and chapter three, and we'll be set for next week. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has been our propitiation, a substitutionary sacrifice, well-pleasing to you for taking our place and paying for our sin. Thank you for those who join us online. We ask that they would have assurance of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would bless them. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Well, we hopefully see you Saturday afternoon in our study of how to have a daily quiet time alone with God and prayer. Until then, Lord bless you.